those magnificent men in a flying machine. They go up to the above, they go down to the above. Up, down, flying around, looping the loop and defying the Hi, welcome to another video. In this video, I want to talk about Louis Blerio. Now, there is a monument for Louis Blerio, who landed his monoplane here on the cliffs of Dover, or the fields of Dover, just situated by the backdrop of Dover Castle. On the 25th of July, 1909, Louis Blerio became world famous for making his first aeroplane crossing across the English Channel, winning a thousand pounds, which was a prize created by the Daily Mail. Now, a thousand pounds in today's money is equivalent to a hundred and twenty thousand pounds. So not a small prize pot, but worth risking your life over. <laughs> Louis Blerio certainly thought so, because he had trust in his um, aeroplane as well as himself. So let me give you a little backstory. Louis Blériot was a French inventor and engineer and he developed the first practical headlamp for cars and established a profitable business manufacturing the headlights and using much of the money to finance his attempts whoops, <laughs> to build a successful aircraft. And he was the first to use a combination of hand-operated joysticks and foot controls as used in present-day aircraft, you know, to operate the aerolons, aerolons? <laughs> Ailerons and the rudder. Um, Blairy was also the first to make a working-powered piloted monoplane. When we think of the aviation pioneers and the aircraft that they were all flying at the time, they were biplanes, right? Pretty much like box kites with a tail and an engine. This film, made in 1903, recalls the first flight of this primitive biplane making aviation history. As the two brothers prepare to attempt the first catapulted takeoff, man's age-old dream of flight becomes a reality. Now, winning the £1,000 prize enabled Blériot to create his successful aircraft manufacturing company, Blériot Aeronautique. Eh, <laughs> parlez-vous français? <laughs> the Daily Mail prize was actually announced in October 1908, with a prize of £500 being offered before the year end. As 1908 passed and no one had taken up the challenge, the prize was doubled in 1909 and like so many other prizes offered it was widely seen as nothing more than a, a, a cheap trick to gain publicity for the newspaper. Blerio actually had three rivals for crossing the channel attempt. There was Hubert Latham, a French national of English extraction, um, flying the Antoinette 4 monoplane and he was favoured by both the United Kingdom and the French to win. The others were Charles de Lambert, a French, no, a Russian aristocrat of French ancestry, and who was also one of Wilbur Wright's pupils. And then there was Arthur Seymour, an Englishman who reputedly owned a, a Voisin biplane. You can see the, um, what would you call it? Uh, plaque <laughs> a little more clearly on this one. I could read all of that, I suppose, couldn't I? But um, no, I've, I've, I've got my kind of memorised script of what I need to say. <laughs> now, Hubert Latham, the other um, candidate or competitor, was actually the first person to attempt to cross the English Channel. But he was unsuccessful. He tried twice and twice he had engine failure. But to his credit, he was the first person to land an aeroplane on a body of water. <laughs> a strange accolade, if you ask me. I mean, he wasn't actually trying to achieve the feat of being the first person to land on water, right? OK, so I'm here at what is now defined as, and it's been here since 1912, I believe, or 19... No, 1909. This is the Blerio Monument here in Dover, on the outside of the castle. And why is it here, you ask? If I can get up a little higher, 
we'll be able to have a look. Just about make out, can't you, the shape of the aeroplane. So this is Northfell Meadow, kind of stretches up from down there and comes across the fields. <laughs> there weren't trees here anyway. But this monument marks the ex exact spot where Blerio landed his aircraft. <laughs> Coming down across the skies. So we've got tree foliage, so it kind of robs us of the joy of walking around the monument. 4.15 a.m. 25th of July, watched by an excited crowd, Blerio made a short trial flight in his Type 11. And then on the signal that the sun had risen, because the competition had to be performed, between sunrise and sunset, he took off at 4.41. Now flying approximately 45 miles an hour and at an altitude of 250 feet, he set off across the channel. Not particularly big, is it? <laughs> now he didn't have a compass and he took his course from the French naval ship, the Escopette, which was heading for Dover. He soon overtook the ship and visibility deteriorate, deteriorated and he later said that for more than 10 minutes I was alone. <laughs> I was alone, isolated, lost in the midst of the immense sea. <laughs> French, right? He didn't see anything on the horizon, not even a single ship. Now the grey line of the English coast, which we can't see now because of all the trees, but you could see it from here. Um, he could see it and the wind had increased and he had been blown off course and was headed east up 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 the coast so towards the lighthouse actually so altering course he followed the line of the coastline about a mile offshore until he sport, spotted Charles Fontaine who was the correspondent of the French newspaper Le Matin and um, Fontaine was waving a large tricolour. Now, unlike his competitor Latham, Blerio had not actually visited Dover, so he didn't have a, f a suitable spot to land, um, and the choice had been made instead by Fontaine, and he had chosen here at Northfell Meadows, and he had selected a patch of gently sloping land where he thought that Blerio could come and just settle the aircraft. Let's go down here and get the angle from up here. So once overhead, he circled twice over the castle and over the meadow until he got to an altitude of about 20 metres and then he cut the engine and he had a heavy pancake landing, that's what they said, due to the gusts of wind and the conditions. And the aircraft's undercarriage was damaged and one propeller was shattered but Blerio got out of the aircraft completely unhurt and the flight had taken 36 minutes and 30 seconds. And this is the actual spot where he landed. You imagine him circling round and round. I would like to think it was clockwise, but uh, if I do a Google overlay, there's a footpath that leads directly up to the, the road that takes us to the um, White Cliffs of Dover restaurant and everything. And I wonder if that was actually the flight path, because the plane, this plane is supposed to depict the actual spot where he landed. And if that's the case, then they've got it in the same angle, haven't they? After making the first channel flight by aeroplane, Louis Blair landed at this spot on Sunday 25th July. This memorial was presented to the Aero Club of the United Kingdom by Alexander Duckham of Duckham's oils, right? Now, not to be outdone by this achievement, the English, of course, had to try and get one better. Again, pretty much like that movie, Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines, where the plot is that the Englishman will win the race from London to Paris. <laughs> but in order to tell you how the English didn't want to get one up, Let's go up the footpath 
It's a place called Swingate, and I'll tell you what happened. Now this whole area behind me is called Swingate, and it sits just opposite the Duke of York's Royal Military School, which, <laughs> I'll put it on the screen, it must date back to Napoleonic times, I would have thought, but certainly the 1800s. It's a military school, isn't it? Opposite the military school was a tiny aerodrome. And you can see why they would have built it, because it's so close to the coast, as well as um, being kind of level and ideal for landing their kite-type aeroplanes. So Charles Royce, of vehicle and aircraft manufacturing fame, would win the imagination of his English compatriots when he announced that he was going to do the double crossing of the English Channel. On his first visit to Dover, with this in mind, Charles decided to open an aeroplane garage. <laughs> and it was here at Swingate that he did that, just to the east of the castle. And the aerodrome he was to use would be built here. On the 20th of May 1910, the Charles Wright flying machine arrived at Dover and the word was out that Charles Rolls was to make the double crossing of the channel. Trial subsequently took place and on the 2nd of June 1910, crowds made their way up here to Swingate Aerodrome to watch. Charles left Swingate at 6.30 p.m. He circled the airfield which was, you know, as I mentioned, opposite the Duke of York School. He climbed to about 800 feet and soon disappeared from view. He flew over the channel and was at Saint-Gat in France at quarter past seven. At 7.45, he was spotted on his return flight uh, approaching the coast. And he turned and flew across the harbour, flying past the town at about a thousand feet. <laughs> he circled the castle, flew over the recently built Blerio Memorial and landed close to his hangar at 8 p.m. The journey took about 95 minutes. So he was the first to travel across and back. When he arrived, the police had to hold back a 3,000 strong crowd who had witnessed the event. Um, after describing how he had dropped messages at, at, uh, to the French at Sangat, he was hoisted on their shoulders and carried in the cheering crowd, whoa, up the Brits. <laughs> Maybe they didn't say that, did they? So yeah, Sangat, uh, from here to Sangat, circled, came back, dropped some leaflets there, came back, circled the town and the harbour front, flew over the Blerio Memorial and landed back here, 90 minutes or so. Let's go down to the coast, to the seafront, and we'll conclude the video there. So we're now down here at Dover seafront. You can see the ferries and everything. Now, a month later, after doing his channel crossing, on 12th of July 1910, Charles Rolls would lose his life due to a controlling wire breaking um, that had been added to his original right flyer. And the accident happened during a flying display in Bournemouth. And Charles Roy Rolls, oh my God, let's keep saying Royce, he was 32 and the first Briton to be killed in an aeronautical accident. But they've got this statue here. This is a bronze statue, and he's dressed in long boots, cap, and short jacket as if prepared for flight. The first man to cross the English Channel and return in a single flight. Now, it was unveiled in April 1912 by the Duke of Argyle and watched by the sculptor, Mrs. Kathleen Scott, who was the wife of the polar explorer, Robert Falcon Scott. And sadly, Unbeknown to anyone present, it's believed that on the 29th of March 1912, so a month prior, Captain Scott had perished in the South Pole. And the news wouldn't take, it would take months to reach the UK. So they didn't even know he was, he was dead. Now the statue was originally located further down on the harbour seafront, um, but had to make way, I'm gonna cross here, had to make way because the ferry was, uh, the ferry port was being built. And so they relocated it to these gardens here. On Friday, the 2nd of June, 1995, Mike Evans, the chairman of Rolls-Royce Heritage Cent um, 
Trust rededicated the memorial. And in his speech, he said that the statue reminded people that it was to commemorate Charles Royce and his greatest achievement, crossing back over, wanted to show you the coast there, um, of, of the first two-way crossing of the English Channel, um, just one year after Louis Blairer's pioneering Channel flight. So he did recognise both of the pilots, and these achievements would alert people to the significance of air travel in the future. So yeah, that's my um, little, little video on Louis Blerio. <laughs> it's really weird filming that because I was going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and trying to remember all the snippets. So Louis Blerio, first man to fly across the English Channel, crash landed the other side of Dover Castle. You can see Dover Castle in the, in the background there actually. And then a year later, Charles Rolls there and back. There's a song in there, isn't there, somewhere? <laughs> Fascinating. We're on the cusp of, you know, there, there's so much history dotted not only around the UK, but certainly here in the southeast. Free to look at, so if you're, if you're in and around the area, um, find it on Google Maps. It's easy to find. I'll put a, what, three words link here for um, the Blairo, Blairio, the Louis Blairio Memorial. <laughs> I stand in the light and then you can see me, can't you? I was always doing that. Right, thanks for watching, bearing with. I'll see you in another video. Bye for now.